We will be starting with the post lunch session, uh, which will be focusing on evolving patterns in China. Uh, so we will be having the discussants here will be Srinivas Prasad and Shankar Kurbi and Professor Parimal Maya Sudhakar. task is to keep all of you awake. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but we have to do it because we have to catch up with many respects, particularly in regard to China. Uh, so the topic of the presentation is the labor migration and challenges to Chinese development. And the first point is why, why do we need to study or why do we need to discuss this issue? which is quite an internal issue of China. In the first session, we have discussed about some of the vulnerabilities or some of the threats that Chinese feel about themselves, about stability to their system, their one-party state, etc. And this is one of the issues. I mean, the other issues we could count as Japan, China is quite vulnerable about Japan and the US-Japan friendship. China is quite vulnerable on the issue of Tibet. They feel quite threatened that if Tibetans really arise and if their movement spread, then their unity and integrity will be under threat. Similarly, the internal dissent is something that China is quite afraid of. That if internal dissent gets organized, if it gets politicized, then it has the potential to overthrow the political system. And therefore, the Chinese Communist Party is quite conscious about handling and dealing the internal dissent. And the internal labor migration that is happening in China is one of the core areas about which Chinese Communist Party is quite concerned about. It's not that the entire dissent is happening because of the internal labor migrants. There are different areas of dissent. Urban residents have their own dissents. There are democratic groups who are fighting for Western kind of democratic system or more political liberalization in China or the protests that are happening, most of the, many of the protests, the majority of the protests are happening in the rural areas, in the countryside, where people are protesting to protect their land, to protect their own financial interests, etc. However, the urban, the, 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 the rural migrants who, who, who come to urban areas, in last one decade or so, many of them have also shown the tendency of showing up their dissent against the state authorities, against the enterprises where they work and all. And therefore, for China, this is an issue of enormous interest and, complicit, and, and, and a complex issue also, because it is also concerning the Chinese, it also deals, it also concerns with Chinese economic growth and the growth rate of China overall, because as we all know that the Chinese model initially was based on the cheap labor supply. And now if the internal migrants, if they are showing up dissent, if they are showing up their demands, if they, they have become demanding, then how Chinese state is dealing with this entire issue should be a matter of interest to all of us. When we talk about today's situation in China, somehow we simply cannot avoid talking about Mao's China. Because whatever the prosperities and problems that China is witnessing today, their roots are in Mao's China. And if we talk about the Mao's China, then there are three, four simple things that we can really talk about. First of all, it was an egalitarian society. Mao's politics, Mao's entire emphasis was on putting politics in the front. He, he always says that politics is most important. Economic, I mean, later on, Tang Shoping said that not politics, but economics is important for Chinese growth. The kind of system that Mao has created, there was two different set of China that Mao created. One was the urban China, which was of which was consisted of the working class China, the real proletariat, who according to Mao are the future of the world, future of the China, and they should be the ruling class of the China. So that urban China was constituted by the working class, the industrial workers of China, and the 
kind of facilities or the kind of social security system that was created for the urban workers, the working class in urban China, that has come to be known notoriously as an iron rice ball system, wherein from cradle to the grave, the state was supposed to take care of the Chinese worker and their families, their education, their health system, their housing, their food, everything. So Chinese state was responsible for providing everything to the Chinese workers in the urban industrial sectors. On the other hand, in the rural China, the communes were created. The Great Leap Forward that Ambassador Rana has talked about in the morning and then the Cultural Revolution. So these two great moments that Mao had created had resulted into establishment of communes in the Chinese countryside. Now through the communes, the land, the entire agricultural land was nationalized and the land really never belonged to anyone but to everyone. That everyone was owner of the land and therefore actually it belonged to no one. So all the villagers through the brigades, they are supposed they were supposed to work on the agricultural land and produce for the entire country, for the entire community. So that was the straightforward system that Mao had created in 1960s and 1970s. However, at the end of Mao's, uh, at the end of 1970s, after Mao's demise, came the era of Tang Xiaoping. And Tang Xiaoping has really revolutionized the Chinese economy. Tang Xiaoping had not come from nowhere. He was there all throughout Mao's tenure. Tang Xiaoping was Mao's comrade during the China's liberation war. He was, a, he, he, he was among the close, close, close people who, who, who uh, close group of people who had carried forward the Chinese revolution. Tang Xiaoping was there in the 1950s and 1960s in the Chinese politics and he was always, most of the time he was at the opposite end of Mao. That he was opposing the Mao's politics from policies from the 1950s, 1960s onwards. And from that point itself, Mao, Liu, uh, uh, Tang Xiaoping, Liu Shaoqi and others, they had formed a group who were opposing Mao's economic policies and the kind of economic structure that Mao had created for China. Their argument was that, that this system was not sustainable, it would not leave China to prosperity and economic progress, although it could be the egalitarian one, but the prosperity would not be there, the progress would not be there. And therefore, Tang Xiaoping in late 1970s and early 1980s came up with lot of new slogans, with lot of new formulations. And one of the most formulation was the socialism with Chinese characteristics, where he brought in the concept of market socialism into China. He also said that socialism is not poverty. You cannot equate poverty to socialism. And socialism is about economic progress, about technological progress. And therefore he said that if someone is getting rich, then it's good. So to be rich is good was the slogan that was given by Tang Xiaoping at that point of time. He also said that I mean, it, uh, although I am saying Tang, but then again Tang also had a lot of supporters within the Communist Party and it was a collective formulation of the Communist Party at that point of time that China is at the primary stage of socialism. Now it was in complete contrast with Mao's formulations where in 1957-58 Mao thought that with a one week China would actually transcend from socialism to communism. Where in the Tang Xiaoping and his coterie said that forget about transition from socialism to communism, we have even not entered the stage of socialism and we are just at the primary stage of socialism, it's a mere primary stage and at this mere primary stage what is required for the Chinese economy is modernization of its crucial sectors. So the four modernizations was the slogan that the agriculture, heavy industry, small industry and defense sector so modernization of these four sectors must take place. That was the primary task that Tang Xiaoping had set for the Chinese economy. And then he also said that as long as the cat catches the mice, it doesn't matter whether the cat is white or black. So what is important is to, 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 to reach the end. What is important is to get what one wants. Now whether cat is white or black, it, it doesn't matter. And as a part of that, he started the open door policy that if for China's modernization, if for Chinese economic growth, if foreign direct investment is required, then we are open to that because that is the, required, that is the requirement of China. 
at that point of time. And this Deng Xiaoping's thoughts, it has catch the imagination of Chinese people, it has catch the imagination of Chinese Communist Party. And throughout 1980s and 1990s, China had gone through the phases wherein Deng Xiaoping had dictated its industrial policies, economic policy. Now for economic growth, for the industrial development, for modernization process, the most important component was how the Chinese, the, how the economy, how the industry in China would get a labor supply. Because the compartmentalization that Mao had created, in that compartmentalization, the Chinese state had created a system of household registration wherein rural people, the rural citizens, simply cannot go to the urban area and settle there or reside there. They would need state permission from traveling from, for, for their migration from a village to the city, from a rural area to the urban area. And the migration usually would take place only when there would be requirement of, requirement of workers in the urban area. So the migration was completely controlled one and it was a minimal one. However, when the open door policy was launched, at that point of time, China was in need of large number of labor, uh, labor force. Now from where this labor would come? The labor would obviously come <coughs> from the rural areas. And for that what was required was dismantling of the commune system. So the first step that Tang Xiaoping did, he dismantled the commune system and then gave the land on lease to each family in the village. Now since each family has got the land, but the number of family members were more, and therefore all were not required to work on that particular land. And then the people also had the economic aspirations. So even after working on their land, whatever time they could get, three months, four months, six months, they could go to the city, urban area and work there. And through that people started migrating from rural area to urban area, from interior provinces to the coastal cities where the large foreign direct investment came. And in the early 1980s, this entire phenomena of internal migration started. If we look at the Chinese vocabulary, they don't call it as migrants, but they call them as peasant workers. For them, I mean, there are no migrants, all are peasant workers, because all those people who are coming from the rural area are peasants, and they are becoming worker, temporary worker in the urban areas. So they call them as the peasant workers. So in 1980, there were hardly 2 million rural migrants who came to urban area. By 2003, this figure reached to about 98 million, 100 million. And in 2013, there were about 200 million rural migrants who were in the urban areas on a temporary basis. And they were supposed to go back to their uh, original places every year. Now this is the official data. One official it is said that the number could be much higher. It could be more than 50% of the number that is being given by the Chinese state authorities or China's statistical year books. So it could be about 300 million or 400 million workers at a given point of time that could be living in China's urban areas coming from the rural areas. Now although this process has started the household registration system which was there, it was not dismantled. The household registration system is still there. For the labor class to come to the urban area, they simply cannot get any kind of social inclusion or they cannot get the rights that are there or the social security facilities, social security system which, which is there for the urban workers or for the urban citizens. So they have to entirely rely on the facilities provided by their entrepreneurs provided by their employers, they have to live in a ghettos mostly at the workplaces. They cannot be accommodated into the cities. And even though accommodation has taken place, those accommodations are not the legal accommodations. They are the illegal bastis, the illegal ghettos that had uh, uh, come up in the Chinese cities. If we look at the value that the rural migrants are creating for the Chinese economy, it is estimated that a one, one rural migrant creates about 25,000 yuan worth of a value for the Chinese economy and in return of that what he earns is maximum 10,000 yuan per year. It's, uh, it's the, I mean the, the, the upper figure, the 25,000 yuan is a conservative figure and the 10,000 yuan that the worker earns is the 
little inflammatory figure that I mean many workers burn up to uh, 5,000, 6,000 yuan as well. Not that everyone earns 10,000 yuan. So among the migrant workers, rural migrants also, there are categories wherein people earn 5,000 from 5,000 yuan to 10,000, 12,000 yuan. Oh, sorry. The major problems that the rural migrants face, and I don't see much difference between the problems that the Indian migrants face, the Indian rural migrants face in urban areas, and the Chinese rural migrants face in the urban areas. The, the most draconian problem that they face was about, is about the low wages and the delay in the payment of the wages. And sometimes it happens that since these are the migrant workers, so sometimes they simply have to forgive their earnings and go back to their native places and then next year go to some other place. So that also happens. That they simply could not follow up with the employer to get all their wages for the period that they have uh, worked there. And then there are a lot of occupational hazards. Most of these migrant workers, they work in industries like construction industry, in the mining sector, or other, or other, other industries which, uh, where the occupational hazards are quite high. By the government figures, around 5,000, 6,000 workers every year die only in the mining sector. And in urban areas, the uh, most of the occupational hazard, uh, occupational deaths happen in the non-state enterprises. About 70% of the occupational deaths ha happen at the non-state enterprises, and about 46% of the workers they work in the non-state enterprises are the rural migrants who come from the rural areas. So they are uh, quite uh, vulnerable to the situation, and also they face social exclusion and discrimination. They simply cannot settle down in the cities. They cannot take any other advantages. Health system is not open to them. They cannot get benefit of governments, any, any health facilities. Their children cannot go to the schools in the urban areas. It, it, although now the situation is changing because of the civil groups which are fighting for their rights, but at least up to the mid of the last decade, that 2004-2005, situation was quite bad for the families of the rural migrants, that their children, either they have to leave their children back in the villages and come to the cities. If they bring their children to the cities, children simply cannot go to any other places. There were no places for the families or for their children where they can socialize themselves or where they can go, uh, go and uh, spend their time. So they were completely excluded from the social life, which, uh, which is there in the Chinese, in Chinese cities, Chinese urban areas. As the rural migrants, as they were facing so many difficulties, so some kind of action <coughs> happened on the part of the rural migrants as well. So what kind of actions happened on the part of the rural migrants? The one was the obvious one that the migrants they started organizing themselves, and this organization. This organizing happened on the basis of the clans, on the basis of the villages or cluster of villages or on the basis of the provinces. Migrants coming from a particular province, they would, uh, uh, they would spontaneously organize themselves or migrants of a particular clan would organize themselves. However, such kind of organizing did not result into unionization of the workers. Although through these organizations, at some point, the migrant workers indeed bargained with the employers. However, they simply did not know the tactics of negotiations. So they also did not know about their rights on what issues they should bargain, where to go to seek uh, grievance, redress, <coughs> etc. And therefore, these organizations often became violent and protested and because of the violence that took place uh, or because of actions of these organizations, the Chinese state and communist party got involved into the entire process. It was an alarm bell for the Chinese state and the communist party that if these things in the urban areas, if it goes out of hand, then it would have detrimental effect on Chinese economic growth. In the year 2003 and 4, it happened that suddenly the <coughs> supply of labor from rural areas, it was slowed down. Now, there is no clarity exactly why that supply was slowed down. Why did rural migrants, they 
stop. I mean, it's not that everyone stopped coming to the urban areas, but their flow was affected somehow, and there was shortage of rural migrants in the urban areas, and industry in many provinces was filling that shortage. Many Chinese scholars call it as the action by the rural migrants, and they attribute it as voting by their feet. That it was a kind of a dissent shown by the rural migrants. And it was a kind of the protest by the rural migrants that we have suffered enough in last 25 years, and now we would really do not want, do not like to go back to the urban areas, go back to the same entrepreneurs, same employers, because we have not got enough. The kind of prosperity that the entrepreneurs have achieved, the kind of prosperity that the urban areas have achieved, we have not got our share. Out of, out of the work that we have done and therefore we are not quite enthusiastic to work in those places. So that was a subtle message that many scholars think that the Chinese rural migrant workers have given at that point of time in 2003 and 2004 particularly. Now if we look at the history of Chinese workers descent in the urban areas, so even in the Mao's period, now uh, there is a vast literature available on that also, the there would be the protest, the direct protest actions, the protest demonstrations or strikes by the workers. But if workers were not satisfied, then what they would do, they would basically slow down the work. So everyone would report at the given time, everyone would come out at the given time, and in between they would simply slow down the work. So the entire production would slow down. And since everyone would be doing the same, so no one would actually point out to them immediately. And through that they would express their dissent. So these kind of things, the Chinese have the tendency of indirect protest or the uh, uh, covert protest, covert, uh, expressing covert dissent. And that's what many scholars say that the Chinese rural migrants also show this tendency. And at that point of time, after 2003-04, the Chinese state, particularly the provincial governments, they became quite active. They started taking interest into welfare of migrant workers. Many of them realize that if they don't act, if they don't work at the right time, then situation could go out of hand. And as it happened with many regards uh, in, in the process of Chinese economic reforms, the initiatives had always been taken at the local levels, at the city level, at the provincial level, at the countryside. Uh, the entire land reform process, uh, process started uh, at, at the provincial level and then the central government took up the land reforms that uh, of dismantling communes and all. So similarly many city governments and provincial governments started taking interest into problems of the rural migrant workers. Now the first thing that they did, they addressed the issue of low wages and non-payment of wages to the rural workers. What they did, they basically surveyed the uh, entrepreneurs, they surveyed, so they surveyed the industries and issued simple notices to all the employers that you have to make all the payments, whatever are the payments that you have not made, whatever are the dues, you have to clear the dues of last three years or so. And that had an effect that many employers, because of the threat that they, they paid from the state, they combined by that and then they ensured the payment of wages to the employers. Similarly, the provincial governments, they went into the skill development program that uh, through the skill development program, the provincial governments and the city governments, they tried to establish contact with the rural migrants. That whenever rural migrants would come to the urban area, they would first give some kind of skill training to these migrants. Through that, they would establish the contact and also would generate kind of awareness among the workers about their rights and would also tell them about the grievance redressal mechanism that is at your disposal to them. And with, uh, with that, they have also established the legal centers at the urban areas, wherein workers can go to those legal centers and the provincial officials or the city officials would provide them legal aid. They would provide them legal aid free of cost. And if there are any cases against the, uh, uh, against the employer, then these uh, city officials would take up those cases and argue with the employers, with the entrepreneurs, and will try to get justice for these workers. The many provincial governments have also established resource centers, wherein they started 
distributing awareness material to the workers about their rights, about the facilities that they could receive on a temporary basis, etc. These resource centers became popular at many places, wherein migrant workers they they they, uh, they, 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 they they start going to the resource centers, they establish contacts with the government officials, and some kind of assurance they got on uh, on their security and on their welfare. The governments also strengthened, tightened the monitoring mechanism. In the entire 80s and 90s, the monitoring of the new industry that was coming up, it was not quite good. And the industrial class, the entrepreneur class, the entrepreneur class had uh, some kind of uh, 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 unstated assurance from the state that you simply ensure economic growth and we would not interfere or we would not impose <coughs> any kind of conditions on you and therefore there was not much monitoring that was happening on the entrepreneurs, on the employers. So they have also strengthened the monitoring and through that monitoring they ensured that the rural migrants get some kind of assurances about their own security. And the state also allowed local media to start covering plight of the rural migrants. This is very typical of the Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party. that. The media, the, not only the state media, but even the private media, the local media, they use it as a tool to keep check on uh, on some entities. When if they want to keep check on particular employer, then they would basically give leeway to a lo to local media to publish news against that employer, to publish news against that entrepreneurs. And based on those news, then they will ask the employer why you are doing so and so. They will not do so directly. They will not directly question. But once matters comes in media, then on the basis of that reportage, they will question the question the employer. So many state governments or provincial governments did that tactic that they ask the reporters to publish the stories. And this has then actually given uh, 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 this has actually resulted into coming up of the civil rights organizations in urban areas who are now fighting for the rights of the migrant workers particularly admission of their children to the schools, health facility to, to, to these migrant workers, uh, the uh, health checkups, free health checkups by the state hospitals for these migrant workers. So these groups are now fighting for the rights of these workers. They are not into the unionizing, but they are basically pressurizing the state to ensure basic rights, basic human rights to these uh, rural migrant workers. At that point of time, the All India China Federation of Trade Unions. It is the only recognized union in China and it is entirely controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. It is a frontal organization of Chinese Communist Party. However, they also came into play. They also became active and started unionizing, mobilizing the rural migrants from 2003-04 onwards. Although in 1994 itself, the Chinese Communist Party had issued a circular that all the uh, new industries and particularly the industries with foreign investment, there the union should go and start unionizing the workers, start mobilizing the workers. However, from 1994 onwards up to 2004, all China Federation of Trade Union, they did not take any kind of interest in unionizing the rural migrants. And that happened mainly because they, they were, I mean, Simply, they did not have resources to do that thing. During the same period, there were a lot of problems that existed in the state-owned enterprises. Now, all China Federation of Trade Unions is basically, uh, they, uh, it represents workers in the state-owned industries. It represented workers for 50 years, uh, the workers who work in the state-owned industries. In 80s, as China has undertaken economic reform process, the restructuring of the state-owned enterprises also started. In 80s and then after 1992, it was, speed, uh, it was fast enough. So when the restructuring started, many state-owned enterprises, they laid off the workers. So this main trade union, it was more concerned about those laid off workers or the workers who were supposed to be laid off in years to come or so. And they were trying somehow to mediate between the state, between the communist party and these workers to ensure that again these workers they do not become violent, they do not form their own groups, 
to protest against their terminations or to protest against withdrawal of the social security that was available to the Chinese workers for more than 50 years or so. And therefore, they simply did not have time to look at the plight of the migrant workers coming from the... On the other hand, there was resistance from the employers as well. That the employers, particularly where foreign investment was there, those employers were simply not ready to give access to their workers and by different means, by delaying tactics or so, they prevented entry of trade union people at the workplaces and even in the areas where workers were living. And therefore, it was difficult even for the state-sanctioned trade union to establish contact with the rural workers. And then there was a third angle also, that the workers, the rural migrants themselves, were not interested in getting unionized. They were not interested in getting mobilized. Now, there could be two reasons for that. The first one is, most of these workers, they had earlier worked in the commune system in rural areas. And they had seen or they have heard from their parents the authoritative nature of the party, that the party would issue dictate and they have to do that thing. And the kind of stagnation that they witnessed for at least two decades or so. And therefore, they were not much interested in establishing solid contact with the party through the union also. So that apathy was definitely there. And also that since the workers did not stay at one place for long, they would stay at one place for six months or for one year or so, and then go back to their villages or go back to other workplaces. So the union, the, there was no consistency in unionizing or mobilizing the workers. And as a result of that, the unionizing started quite late, only after 2003 or four. And when it started, first the trade union started to mobilize workers at the workplaces. They did not succeed in that. So they changed the strategy and they started mobilizing the workers, not on the workplaces, but at the places where workers used to stay at the urban areas. So those localities became the politicization process, uh, the, the politicization centers of the rural migrants. Now out of all these things, one would expect that this would lead to greater unionization and mobilization of rural migrant workers in, under the All China Federation of Trade Unions. However, that did not happen. Even now, not more than 30% of the workers are, are, are members of All China Union of Trade Federation, the rural migrant workers. And they are simply members. They are, they are, I mean, it's not that they are completely unionized or polarized. All China uh, Federation of Trade Unions simply cannot go on a strike based on this membership. Because workers do not have that kind of faith on the trade unions as well. They are not that much attached to the philosophy of the trade union or going on the strike, etc. And therefore, this is simply the membership that uh, the, the, the federation has been successful in only doing the membership of, uh, of the trade union among the rural migrants and that to only up to 30% of the rural migrants they could cover so far. But as a result of this entire process, the government and Chinese Communist Party became active and they started formulating labor contract law for China. Till 2007, there was no contract labor law for China. In 1994, China came out with its labor law, but that was a generalized labor law. It was good in its intention, it was comprehensive in its intention, but as far as generalities were concerned, there were many ambiguities which were there and no one were sure about how to deal with the workers' problems based on the 1994 labor law. So by 2004, the party also started the process of formulating the contract law, the, the, the labor contract law. And they issued the first draft, then they issued the second draft. There were intense discussions that happened on the first and second draft. And based on the discussions and the inputs that the Communist Party got, Ultimately, they have formulated the labor contract law and which came into implementation from 1st January 2008. In the entire process, the stakeholders which were there in the formation of the labor contract law, of course, it's the workers, but it was, it was basically the All China Federation of Trade Unions that represented the workers in this entire process. <coughs> There is no clarity whether government has actually sought inputs directly from the rural migrant workers. It was the government, the party representatives of the union representatives 
who have presented workers position in front of the government then the central government was the main stakeholder the provincial and city governments they also played important role they also gave their inputs they also pressurized the central government they also lobbied to formulate the law according to their own needs and then different commerce chambers particularly the european unions the european union the american chambers even the japanese commerce chambers they implemented they they, they 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 exerted their pressure on the chinese communist party the context that they have established till that point of time with the chinese communist party they utilized all those contacts and they tried to see that the new labor contract law does not become detrimental to their own economic interest so the, through this entire negotiating process the <coughs> labor law is now in place the labor contract law is now in place in china i don't go into a detail into the labor contract law because that's quite i mean it's a very big law it's a quite big, uh, big document more than 100 100 articles are there and it would actually require entirely a different session on the labor contract law but what this labor contract law achieved was for the first time it became mandatory on the employer to issue a contract to an employer to, to an employee till 2007 there was no mandatory provision or there was no clause no rule that actually asked uh, that, that the employee that it was essential for the employer to issue a simple labor contract to the employee from 2008 now at least employee can ask for the labor contract and in the labor contract employer has to state all the terms and conditions of the employer including the wages the work conditions etc etc so that's the foremost important thing and is this in the unorganized sector as well yes it's everywhere it's everywhere it's in the unorganized sector also so that's the important thing that has happened however there are two important lacunas in this uh, uh, act it's in fact not lacuna in the act but in the processes and it's in the behavior of the employers behavior of the workers and all that what if employer and employee that they simply do not sign the agreement they simply do not sign the contract as was the practice till 2005 6 or so then no one can go to the court labor court and ask that my labor right was violated because there was no contract employer can simply say that this person has not worked with me if there was no labor contract so there are many cases wherein labor rights have been violated but laborers cannot go to the court because uh, uh, the contract was not signed between the employer and the employee and the second part is again the monitoring mechanism there was no there is hardly any monitoring mechanism in place in china to ensure that all the employers are following the labor contract law so there are legal centers but the law on the legal center is so so, uh, so high that they can handle not more than 10% of the cases that come to them. So the pendency of cases is quite high. The cases that legal centers handle, they are quite successful in ensuring payment of wages to the workers and all. However, simply there is no manpower to ensure that the laborers' complaints are being heard and then employers are being taken to the task. So this is the condition of the rural migrants in the urban areas in China. Technically, they still do not have citizenship rights in the urban areas. They simply come there. Now, through some informal arrangements, they get certain kind of facilities. But it's still not quite clear whether they are entitled for, the, for those facilities throughout their life or not. In most of the cases, the provincial and city governments make it quite clear that they are not entitled, these facilities are not for the workers for throughout their life. What, they can get these facilities maximum up to six months or one year or so. So those kind of conditions are there. And therefore this issue is not entirely settled so far. What kind of turn this issue would take, we are really not sure. That in the future, if the rural migrants, they start mobilizing themselves, or if they think that it's not worth for them to come to the urban area, then what kind of effect it would have on Chinese economy. Certainly, it would have negative effect on the Chinese economy. So that's the challenge to the Chinese authorities, the Chinese state, to maintain the equilibrium of the trust, that it has to maintain trust of the workers and it has to maintain trust of the employer as well. So far, Chinese state and communist, communist party have been more or less successful by various means in ensuring that on the one hand, the, ruling, the rural migrants, they also keep on having some kind of trust 
on the highest state authorities that ultimately the state would listen to us the communist party would listen to us and also maintaining trust of the employer that state would not intervene too much into the affairs of the uh, uh, enterprise and therefore the enterprise would have luxury of having its own affairs so how long the chinese communist party would be able to sustain this equilibrium it's not clear i mean these are great great areas also another challenge is ensuring continuous labor supply this is i mean if the labor supply stops then the entire economy would come to the green and that's a great challenge in the entire the as we have discussed in the first half the chinese communist party has got its legitimacy from the economic welfare that it has provided to its citizens it has been successful in uplifting large number of chinese citizens from below the poverty line however there are still large number of people who are under poverty line or who are just above the poverty line they are still not into the lower middle income group or they are not into the middle income group so if chinese state chinese communist party as it claims now to represent everyone in the society if they have to maintain that legitimacy then somehow they have to provide justice and security to the rural migrants as well they simply cannot ignore 200 million people who are coming to the city every year and going back half uh, empty handed or uh, half heartedly so if chinese communist party want to continue to rule china then they have to ensure they have to ensure that this class also keeps on supporting the chinese communist party so these are the challenges that are there for the chinese communist party as far as the rural migrants are concerned and these are also related to the chinese economic development So, uh, is that perspective of cheap labor a Western perspective or is it an Indian perspective? In terms of India, how do you rate the labor rate in China to the labor rate in India? Well, I mean, first of all, from the perspective of the rural migrant workers, it's actually not a cheap labor for them. I mean, it was not a cheap labor for them for at least for two decades or so, because the in the rural area after dismantling of the commune, they were facing unemployment or half unemployment. and therefore for them it was actually an opportunity and therefore for 20 years or so even though wages were quite low and the work conditions were very bad there were not much dissent that was visible among the rural migrants now as far as uh, 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 comparison between indian and chinese workers is concerned then we have to actually look at the sector wise uh, i mean construction sector or manufacturing sector or mining sector etc so uh if you take up the uh, textile industry or if you take up the uh, supply chain the the uh, uh, the outsourcing of the uh, manufacturing of the cloths you take up that supply chain then chinese workers we could say are at par with the indian workers there is not much difference that we could see between them the chinese workers indeed work in the sweat shop like conditions that indian workers so far are not subjected to the condition of indian workers are still better in that particular sector in the construction sector the indian workers are at a uh, at a worse uh, condition because there is no awareness among the indian construction workers the chinese construction workers at least they have a level of awareness where they know about certain kind of rights they know about their wages they know about how many days they have worked how many hours they have to work and all Indian construction workers, they are actually they do not have that kind of uh, uh, political consciousness among them. So in that sector, we can say that it's uh, Indian workers are uh, uh, at a worse condition. Mining again, I am not sure about the Chinese conditions exactly, but my guess is that it would be the same in India and China. It would not be much different in India and China. And sir, in terms of uh, like the per hour rate, like does China have a rule like per hour wages or minimum per hour wages? Per yes, they, they they do have. Okay. They do have. I don't know exactly what is the rate now, okay. but they do have. And recently, just last year or couple of years back, they raised the wages. So, so you have to change it from two thousand four hundred. Two thousand four hundred. In Shanghai, it is minimum for contract labor is one thousand nine hundred. As you mentioned, that one of the reasons to rural migrants to shift in the urban area is that. Earlier, it was a communal system. 
And one of the reasons is their economic aspirations. <coughs> economic aspirations is there, and that's why the sector from one rural area to the urban side. If there are criteria like uh, infrastructural issues, facilities available in a rural area, like in Indian scenario, what happens is one of the reasons is that we stick to the urban area rural population because they get the better facilities available in a urban area compared to the rural area. So what is the position of that particular aspect? Whether this is only economic aspirations or... No, it's not only economic aspirations. I mean, there are different kind of people who are migrating. I mean, in India also, I don't agree that all the rural migrants in India are migrating to the urban area only because of the infrastructure issues. Uh, one of the aspects... One of the, I mean, uh, there is one of the categories. Yeah, so, like in China also, I mean, there are few people who could actually manage their household based on their agricultural earning. But since there are more members in the family and they can afford to go to the urban area, so they go there and earn as much as they can. So, that's an additional income to them. But for many, they simply cannot survive on the agricultural income and they have no, no other option but to go to the urban area and also earn there. So half a time they would, they would uh, do work in the agricultural area and half a time they would work in the um, uh, industry. Another thing that basically based, based upon that is, basically this is a two sort kind of a thing because one side if a welfare scheme increases for a migrant worker, like if the case of a Henan province, when they have given a permanent residency kind of a thing, they relax the criteria, there is a tenfold increase in a migrant rate. So once we give a more facilities there, chances of that from a rural migrant to the urban migrant set will be much higher, which itself says from a 2 million increase from 1980 say, to 200 million. So what to do that kind of a dichotomy when one-sided giving of more facilities also mean that increasing the population from a rural area to the urban side and giving a heavy weight on a urban side which is happening also in the Indian scenario. Yes. yes. Which province you said? Henan province. Henan province. So once they relax the criteria, there is tenfold in it. So it's a, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a dilemma. It's yeah. a dilemma. So that is another so, type of yeah. dilemma. That no, but it's a dilemma. And, uh, I mean, and I would also want to add, maybe I would also add to this. Well, uh, these dilemmas are handled by basically carrying out experiments. So this Hanan thing is an experiment. Yeah. So in Beijing and Shanghai, the hukos have been relaxed in a gradual manner for the last 20 years. So they increase and decrease the quotas depending on how, you know, again, this goes to the point of how nimble the government is. So actually at this point, I just wanted to give you a more uh, sort of uh, real picture of uh, migrants. So what do these people do? Uh, they do not just construction, they work in restaurants, they work in uh, hair salons, they work in uh, all kinds of industries, service industries largely. And uh, I wish at this point there were really some Chinese speakers here from China uh, because uh, uh, after this presentation, a uh, Chinese uh, urban resident would have uh, had a lot of things to say. So I'm just going to say one or two points, so it will just give you some balance to this uh, topic. So why do these frictions arise in the urban areas? It's because of pressure on the urban infrastructure, like the subway or you know, even people who drive cars don't like uh, migrants. So in the last 30 years, I think migrant, the word itself in Chinese, has gone from becoming the most preferred status to an abuse. So today, if you call someone a peasant, it's an abuse in almost any part of China, especially in cities. And this is because all the urban problems are sort of, uh, you know, uh, the so source is somehow rooted to the migrants. And uh, if you go to, say, Beijing, after beyond the fourth ring road, the, way, the best way to identify these migrant colonies is suddenly you will see these uh, societies apartment blocks where a lot of cars are parked on the streets which basically if you're with a Chinese friend, the Chinese friend will immediately look at you and say like the migrants have taken over which basically means the basements have been occupied the migrants live in basements so they are also called ant people, Zura so that's like ant people so if, in a, if you can park a car in that uh, area there will be 8 people living so 4 at a time, uh, morning shift and night shift and the way they are brought from the villages to the city are these uh, laobans, the, the contractors, the bosses. So they are recruited in the uh, countryside, brought to the cities and most of the income is held back. 
which is why they can never protest. Because when they go back uh, at spring festival or something, that is when the payment is made. So while they are in the city, their accommodation is given and a portion of their wage is deducted and food is normally given by the, the work unit. So this is why they can't protest. So they are in a very strange situation. So once they come, they are stuck for a cycle and then they go back and then they decide whether to come again or not. So, I mean, these are some of the uh, sort of the, the, the practical, the human side of what these migrants go through and what equally the urban residents go through. Because that's why I said, you know, I wish there were some Chinese speakers because they would have told you what exactly it means to have migrants in a city. Because these urban residents have gone through this whole process of relocating to Beijing or Shanghai and getting a hukou. So, they don't want anyone else to uh, infringe upon their enjoyment of urban infrastructure. So that that is actually the source of day-to-day -day friction. So that's where you see fights breaking out. Something there. I mean, uh, in, in India, migration is not uh, under any kind of regime. Anybody yeah. move anywhere. In China, is it strictly regimented? Yes. Are there quotas fixed? Are there uh, permits to be taken? For hukou, yes, there are quotas and permits. But for uh, this informal sector, so forth, it is not regulated. It is controlled by these uh, mafias. So from Shanxi, there will be one person who will always get workers for a particular set of businesses in a particular neighborhood. So they control. It's like a value chain. They control the whole value chain. They recruit people. They already know where they will be working. Though, so they bring them there. If it's a construction site, for example, they know how long they are required for. They decide. Sometimes with their children, they negotiate with the parents saying, how much I will pay you for this kid. So you give me four kids, they are required in a restaurant. So, I mean, it's it's quite sad. I mean, if you walk to one of these basements and see how they live, it's quite uh, disgusting. So next time you go to a restaurant and look at a waiter, you will have so much of respect for them. But you should know that the Hukov system, uh, Hukov system has no equivalent anywhere in the world. What it really means is the Hukov is the legitimate right you have to reside in a city. And it's a form of internal passport, really. It's an internal passport that gives you legitimacy to live in a city. If you don't have that, you're a non-person. And a non-person, of course, cannot have rights and cannot protest. It's a, it's a bizarre situation. And I sometimes wonder, these admirers of China, they never talk about this. Yeah. This is a non-issue. And I wonder, uh, where is their humanism that they exhibit so permanently? Uh, two points to make. You spoke about uh, Hanan and uh, the migration, but it is not uh, throughout the province, Hanan province. Now, recently, I mean, I'll give you the very recent data. Hunan is known as uh, China's Punjab. That's, I mean, the title is that. And But what is happening in Hunan province is if you look at the three major sectors, economic sectors, primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, Hunan is emerging, especially the belt, Changchou and Mengchou, the belt of 200 kilometers, is emerging with the strong tooling and heavy metal industry, actually. That heavy metal industry, tooling industry, is replacing the primary, primary sector. So agriculture is growing down. That doesn't mean that the productivity is going down, obviously. So the productivity is still stable. <coughs> the share of agriculture in the primary sector is going down. The secondary sector is coming up. So, see, here is something. There are two levers over here. Both are, both are working in, you know, both in different directions, river direction. The Chinese economy, the manufacturing coming down in Hanan, it is going up. In overall in China, actually, when the government is trying to boost uh, the agriculture production, it is coming down in Hanan. In Hanan, what is very prominent among these uh, three sectors is tertiary education, a tertiary now. I mean, industry, it's, uh, ratio is still lower than the tertiary. So hospitality, uh, urbanization is going high. And that is the reason what Santosh was also mentioning too. Once there is a pressure for that, you need to open up, you need to relax the upper limit for giving licenses to those who are coming. And this is not flat opening actually, I mean, uh, not random. This is those who are skilled, their education has to have a certain criteria, like in Shanghai also. 
if you have a PhD and your earning is per month more than 10,000 RMB, then, then only you can apply. There is a criteria for a new application also. I think uh, there's two, three points. From a migration point of view, just to give a comparison of how does it look, the last 20 years, the number of people who have gone to US as migrants, and if you compare the number of people who have kind of migrated from rural to urban in China, rural to urban in China is higher than the number of people for the last 20 years who have gone to US. That's one alarming statistics. And now, what is happening is that year on year, the average age of migrants is coming lesser and lesser. And that's a cause of worry for China. Five years ago, the average age of migrants from rural to urban was in the age of 20 to 21. Last year's statistics say it's about 17 years. That's very concerning because the people who are migrating have just completed or not even completed their higher school and the, they get into the bottom most of the pyramid. But what has happened in the industry is that a lot of automation has happened and then that work is no longer there. It's in construction or manufacturing. What is happening is that a lot of the work that the high school people used to do, it's no longer there, it's automated. Now these guys have nowhere to go as uh, Dr. Rana said. Now it's getting into a situation where there are millions of people are migrating and then there is this term that they use known as Levy's turning point, where they are saying that at one point of time, this whole thing breaks up. There is nothing known as rural to urban because at any point of time, you have 35% or 40% of your population in urban, that is actually gets merged at one point of time. And that's the problem that China is facing. So that's something that very alarming because the migrants who used to be knowledge workers at one point of time are no longer knowledge workers. And the knowledge workers in the urban area are migrating to US. There are tons and tons of people, I mean, actually, even India. India and China are the highest migrant people to US and UK, right? So the knowledge workers are moving to US. The people from the urban area are now left with people who are coming at the age of an average age of 17 years. So that is creating a lot of job vacuum for the middle related work and that's a causing uh, alarming problem for China. There's an American source. Yes. Yes. There's also another. Just one interesting source material. Uh, there's an American student who's doing a PhD on uh, this migration patterns. And he spent one year working in a hair salon so that he could mix with uh, migrant workers and understand their experience. That was his field work. So I recently heard him speak, so I, I, I can't recall his name, but if you Google, I'm sure you can find him. He's doing a PhD on migration and he uh, worked as a hair salon. That's, that's the lowest uh, sort of uh, job that's available in uh, uh, Chinese cities. If you're a graduate from a rural area, you just go and cut hair. And the cheapest haircut is about 15-20 RMB and these people will cut your hair. If you want a person who's trained, you have to pay 100 RMB and you get a better hair. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know. I said. <laughs> 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 yeah, I had a nice hair. <laughs> 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 yeah, sir, uh, one question regarding the migration of population, like, sir, from, uh, you know, of population, like Sir mentioned from China to US. But the data actually shows that the number of people who have actually, Chinese people who have gone to US, uh, the number of people who are coming back from US back to China is more than the people who have actually, you know, Indians have, they don't come back to India, but you know, Chinese people actually come back to, uh, you know, China once they go back to not US. Not all, not all. Mm -hmm. but yes, yeah, in terms of data, like, yeah, but more. In, in terms of the out migration, mm -hmm. more Chinese are going to the US than the, than the, than the Indians. Yes. So, in so, that regard, more Chinese are returning to China. Yeah. So the trend is actually increasing, like, yeah. you know, so okay. any reason for that particular trend, why more people who have actually been to US are coming back to China? Government incentives. Okay. Government gives a lot of incentives. Uh, for example, when Chongguan Sun was set up, okay. Chongguan Sun is the Silicon Valley, it's uh, near Beijing. So uh, Hua Chao's, uh, these people uh, called Hua Chao's, and they are given funds to set up businesses. So if the Chinese government wants to kickstart the urban area, uh, no, sorry, not urban area, economic area, the first target is these overseas Chinese who have gone to the US and maybe done a PhD or something. So they are given funds and invited back saying, we will give you uh, office space, we'll give you uh, area. If you're doing some research on a patent, bring it to China and we will help you to execute it and bring it to the market. 
So this is the reason a lot of overseas Chinese these days, if you look at all these internet companies, they're all uh, top management is completely overseas Chinese. Uh, so even if you go to small towns, you will see a lot of uh, new industry. So every time Chinese government comes up with a new, like I think a few years ago, they decided to modernize uh, Xi'an as a western frontier. And uh, so this was their game plan. So they got Samsung as an anchor investor and then everyone else was overseas Chinese. If they set up a new SEZ, normally the first movers will be overseas Chinese who are from the same region, who are living in the US, but they will somehow be brought back by the Chinese government by giving a lot of incentives. It's basically government money which will come and occupy all these things and they will serve as the first movers and then encourage others to uh, foreign investors to move into these areas. So that is a big source and sa same thing with universities. I think universities also have very attractive packages if Chinese, uh, overseas Chinese come back and agree to either spend even six months every year teaching or doing research or everything. So this is one I think big reason. India, to the best of my knowledge, I think they give a OCI card, but I don't see NRI being attracted in this kind of way. Studied in America and come back is actually sea turtles. Mm -hmm. Chinese, the Chinese language is extremely colorful in its phraseology. I don't know the Chinese expression, but it translates as sea turtles. Is it Pachao sea turtles? No, no, no. Pachao are Chinese. Yeah, I, I meant sea turtles. Sea turtles. I just find the it's Sea turtles. Uh, the, the other relevant point is that yes, uh, a fair number are coming back now and the facilities offered to uh, eminent professors for instance who come and teach in Chinese universities is under something called the Thousand Talents program, Qian something, uh, whatever is the word for talents. Uh, the, uh, under the Thousand Talents program, very generous uh, facilities. I mean, international salary levels are paid to these professors. We have nothing remotely comparable. Uh, and truth to tell, behind all this is, uh, is a way of thinking, really. I, 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 I am sure I will offend a lot of people in saying this, but I'll say it anyway. In India, we have always looked upon those who have gone away as guys who kind of ducked out, the guys who didn't have the courage to stay in the courts. So there is a kind of tension in the <coughs> way in which uh, people in academia within India look upon their brothers and sisters who have done well, be it at Stanford or California system or whatever. And um, I don't think in India there is ever uh, a notion that we would extend similar facilities to uh, international uh, uh, professors. And take the IIMs. Sorry uh, to hold a mirror to you guys. But uh, uh, in how many IIMs do we have international professors uh, teaching? We don't give them facilities, we don't give them salaries that are comparable. Because we say our salaries are like this, why the bloody hell should you guys earn more, more just because you ran away abroad and made tons of money? That's our way of thinking. Maybe we are right. In the process, the Chinese education system has undergone a degree of internationalization which doesn't exist in India. Now, we say, you know, we are like the frogs in the pond, we are extremely happy, we are the best in the world. But our world is circumscribed by the pond. Why is it that Indian educational institutions don't figure in global rankings? <coughs> I mean, we are pathetic. Now, somebody will turn around and say, we don't care. That's the Indian attitude. Alka made a point that you know, the Chinese reach out to international standards because the Chinese have understood that joining the world is not a matter of standing on the roadside and defying the world and saying, I don't care for your standards. Uh, thanks to the WTO <coughs> process, which was so much harder for China because, you know, to join 
as a latecomer is a very tough process. And there are people who used to say that India should quit WTO. Do you remember? There was a movement for that. Uh, joining WTO, China had to really go through the eye of the needle in order to qualify. The Chinese have embraced international standards in a spirit that by accepting these standards, they are internationalized. In India, we don't accept international standards. We stand and argue. We say, no, your standards are lousy. Your standards are wrong. This is not the way to join the world. So we have also, if we say, in Sino-Indian discussion, or Indian Sino, or India-China, frankly, as it should be, forgive my pointing out. Uh, uh, you know, I, I can offend a lot of people in one single statement. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, that, uh, that we should be a little more, uh, we should be a little less of outliers. We are outliers. Outlier is a very strange English word. Not everyone is familiar with it. An outlier is somebody who refuses to join. It's a fact that the Doha round has been sabotaged by India. Do we forget how Mr. Kamal Nath behaved at, it was in Doha again, in, was it before the 2004 election or the 2009 election? I think just before the 2009 election. And he said openly, how can I accept this because we lose the election? Which was nonsense because the Indian voting public doesn't give two figs for WTO. But the chattering class in Delhi believes it does. So, uh, but if you go back to the editorials that were written at the time, there were open public comments in Indian newspapers which acknowledged that Kamal Nath had essentially played the role of the blocker at uh, that particular Doha round. And now we lament that uh, TTP is coming and other things are coming and we'll be left behind. I think we don't acknowledge that we have played quite a big role in sabotaging an agreement at WTO. Because we imagine that the Indian voting public will oppose this. I don't think the Indian voting public cares. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's this one sobering thought question just coming up. Yeah. Uh, maybe I just complete this and we go for a good question. Uh, because essentially what's, uh, what I my takeaway from the session was that the political system is unable to accommodate the migrations that the economy requires. So what I see is a clash that's building up between the political system and the economy. And no matter how strong the Communist Party of China is and how strong the political system is, ultimately it is uh, the economy that's going to determine. So I don't know how this is going to play out. I mean, I, I would love to have thoughts on this. And that's why we need to keep watch on this. <coughs> Good evening, good evening, sir. Uh, in context of <coughs> Indian companies doing, who want to do business, Indian companies or startups who want to do business with China, in China. Now, at present, the uh, scenario in China is, is going from production mode to consumption mode. So, what steps Indian companies or startups should uh, take that, uh, uh, the steps it should take that uh, if it wants to do business in China, then it will be readily acceptable in the Chinese market. And my second thing is that, uh, my second question is that, uh, to what uh, extent of the period this the Chinese the strategy for going from production to consumption mode, it is uh, the Chinese are going to follow. And if there is any change in the strategy, then what could be the possible change in the strategy? <laughs> well, the good thing is that uh, one thing that uh, China recognizes India as being very strong in is IT. So anything to do with the internet, the engineering, IT, uh, these things, you know, when they see, actually when most people in China see Indians, they assume you're an IT engineer. So you have to uh, <laughs> explain. Uh, so, so that is one good thing. So. Uh, uh, if you want to set up something, you will actually be given a lot of importance. And there are a lot of uh, these zones being created uh, for uh, 
IT companies. I think the most recent one was two months ago, I was part of a CII delegation, which went to a place called Gui An. Not Gui Yang, but Gui An. It's in Guizhou province. And I think uh, NIIT signed a MOU with the local government there to set up a training institute. So anyway, so in zones like this, this is the big data business development area or something. So in a place like this, for example, tomorrow if you give a call to the Guizhou government, they will welcome you. They will give you office space. They will set you up from day one. They will make sure that you don't lack anything as long as you keep showing some progress. So that's one thing. So that you can do very well. And uh, in terms of your second question was this uh, consumption shift. I don't think it's going to change very, t I mean, these plans are made for decades. I mean, China once, they don't normally backtrack on their policies, especially big ones like this. The economy is moving to consumption. They have moved away from manufacturing. So there's no fear of, you know, something else coming and spoiling the party. So I think this will continue. And uh, the last thing is, uh, uh, have you heard of a company called Inmobi? Yes. So, yeah. So, the Inmobi is actually very successful. Uh, their CFO, he was ex-Wipro, a guy called Mr. Narayan. So, uh, so, they have done very well. I think there's one more startup uh, from India which has now currently become the number four in its category uh, in China. Uh, it's a very uh, low profile startup, I can find you the name, I, I don't know. It does some very niche activity in the IT space and uh, very quickly after entering the Chinese market, they became number four in China, which is quite a big deal because in, in China there are hundreds of these internet startups doing everything. So that's a good example and unfortunately uh, the Indian government has not been talking about it, CII doesn't even know it I think. Uh, but there is this one guy, he was interviewed by a Chinese uh, media house recently, I just caught an interview. Even I have never met him, uh, I've never heard of him, so that's why I can't even remember the name. So there are some very good examples of Indian companies doing very well as a startup in China because as a startup, your you know the infrastructure, the incubation facilities in China are really world class. Mm -hmm. Like Chinghua actually offers free servers to I don't know the entire Jomansun area, which is literally the entire Silicon Valley. Now people might say that is so that the government can control it. But for a startup, I don't think you're thinking of those issues. You're looking at what is the quickest way to get the fastest server so that your product can reach millions. And in China, that uh, that is just plug and play. Mm. So I, I think uh, that's that's my intuition. I think you should listen to him. My yeah. question was the director. No, actually, I think it's a startup thing. I think the best place in the planet to do startups is in India currently, <laughs> not China. Actually, after US. If there is one country that has built a beautiful ecosystem for startups, it's India. Just to give you an example, in Bangalore, NASCOM has taken an initiative to say that how do we actually build and nurture 10,000 startups? 10,000. Telangana has done something similar. Andhra has done something similar. All these IT clusters, Pune, NCR, your Hyderabad, Chennai, Bangalore, all of them have taken an initiative backed by NASCOM to say that how do we nurture this? the startup community. One of the biggest things that you need in a startup community is that you need a team of about 10 product architects. Right? You don't need hands, right? you need brains. And product architects, if you need to 10, you will find it extremely difficult to get it in China. So my suggestion is that if there is a thought process to build a startup, you should look exploring India. Sorry, I, uh, I think this question was if you have to go for the Chinese market, market. Okay. and depending on okay. China, what, how does okay. it look so like? Then, then probably it's not the startup. And yeah. I'll kind of second what you say. There are huge amount of multinationals that are setting up their shops in China, the way set, they set up their shops two decades ago in India. The TIs of the world, the Qualcomm's of the world, the huge semiconductor companies, the network companies or the device companies. They are looking at talent partners who can speak English and who can actually work with the American counterparts. And if you have a base and you can actually go and then register yourself, there are half a dozen ways of registering yourself in China. I think that's a beautiful story because the first question these multinationals ask, when they ask Saskin is that, the moment I put the slide saying that we also have a presence in China, the questions are more on China than are in India. <laughs> what do you do in China? Can you help us in China? So the primary business becomes China for me and the secondary yeah. business becomes India. I mean, the point I'm trying to tell you is that while you get equal good number of business, you stand a chance to become 
ahead of your competition if you have a story of China from an engineering standpoint. I want to add just two points. I mean, since there was one question, consumption specific. Uh, yes, what Santosh said is exactly right. In China, uh, the problem is you don't expect that consumption is going to go up. Every Chinese household got everything which we are dreaming right now. Refrigerator, cooker, machines, everything we got. So what do you mean by consumption? You cannot just boost consumption by saying that they got money, they will go buying spree. You know, that is not possible. What you can set is services. What uh, she was also saying, but services is what easily you can set. But the problem is, I was supposed to, I, uh, I had an uh, opportunity to talk one US based company who wanted to sell a software in China. I don't know how come, the China connection works in different ways. Sometimes they misunderstand us as a seller, consultant, ever, anything. He just called him, I went to meet him at ILC, and he said, Arvind, I want to sell this thing, how I can sell. I said, first, make sure that you are ready. Are you ready to share your source code? Because that is the first compliance you have to meet in China. Impossible. We are a US company. I said, even you stay in US. You don't dream about going to China because the first compliance is you have to talk about your source code. If any company you're going to, in, in provincial companies or state companies, you're going to talk and go and talk about JVs, first of all. If not, Marjan ME is a big thing, actually. Then they will ask for your source code. And if you're not ready to share your source code, simply forget about it. You cannot do it. Because there are certain standards if you want to succeed in China, you have to maintain that. So it is difficult for you to do, uh, do a startup. That was start first startups. Last year, there were 1,100 startups. All 1,100, uh, most of them 1,100. I, I can claim 900 were from Bangalore. I think so. And uh, so India is the best uh, place to start up. But that, I'm not trying to discourage all of the participants you know, who try to associate with China. Look at it as uh, a, a one place where you can uh, use it as a GPN, you know, or a place of global production network. It's one place you can use it, not necessary to stay it over here. Make your contacts, start up new new thing, and use it uh, that way. Coming to consumption and investment, I'll just give you one minute brief thing. Consumption in China is not going to increase. And if Chinese government is saying that consumption is increasing, it is not that that is not the case. The stimulus package in 2008, about 480 billion RMB, went to boost consumption, but that did not go as a consumption, but that went into the market as investment. Investment to build tracks, investment to build uh, railways, investment, but that is not a part of consumption. That is again a part of investment. So Chinese government would give you or some data which will make you feel that it is increasing the consumption, which is not the case. And my gut feeling is next five to six years, this economy is slowing down. The Chinese have stopped investing in mm. earlier to uh, real estate and then shares. They're nothing to say now. So the consumption is going to get affected very badly in China, I think. Well, but there's, there's a counter question. They are saying that it's a market-driven socialist economy. Yes. Uh, you know, a large portion of the GDP has to come out of the conspicuous consumption. If that consumption does not take place, how does the market size increase? That's, That's the problem. problem. That's the problem. Consumption. consumption. It's only 37%. Yeah. Right. They and habitually. Chinese are big savers. Yes. They, they have the largest amount of savings yes. in the world. You know, at an individual <coughs> level, per capita. Question is, if there is this hype, India stood to some extent true to that hype, saying that we are going to be a good consumer society. And that brought in that kind of investment. But if this hype does not stand true for China, what happens? No, I said in the near future, in six to seven years, it is not going to happen. But consumption, definitely, China is the biggest consumption market, actually. So somewhere about, about, somewhere about 100 trillion plus. But that is not in the near future, maybe after 10 years. It takes, even, because economy doesn't work in thin, thin air, actually. It has its own physics. You know, it, it has a push and pull factor. So considering what is happening in present context, prices are going down, even the leaders are not coming. Nobody is going to own. Uh, risk or the blame. So everybody is running the same, or the central government or provincial government also. 
So I think that it will take time. Even if you look at the share markets, I think Santosh would come in here. Uh, the bond market, the bond market is a share market is new to Chinese. Till before 2004, Chinese did not know even what is share market. Now the Chinese have opened the OTC market, over the counter bond market, to the overseas people to come and you know, buy the uh, provincial uh, shares. But that is again the auspicious of central government. So everything is restricted. It is opening up. It is opening up, and I think that it would take another at least 10 years to open completely. So consumption is not happening. Consumption is not happening right now. It is completely. I mean, we will misunderstand what that if consumption is happening. Sir, uh, what this suggests is that there is a real slowdown. Yeah. There, there is slowdown, but uh, yeah, just being underestimated. Yeah. GDP growth is going down, but in absolute terms, it is such a yes. big market. Yes, that's the point. Even I don't think they will they will target six percent. It's impossible. Six to seven. Not 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 even six percent. Hardly now twenty days left for closing the financial year in China. Well, well, the truth is, how does it matter to India? Any day and on any count, it's ten times bigger than India. Right. Even if they were to come down to six percent, what consequence will it have for India? No, I mean, yeah, it's a good, very good question. <laughs> And that's also the growth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, very good question. If China is slowing down, uh, what, how it will have affect? Yeah. See, uh, China the consequence for yeah. not just India but for the world is that if the Chinese government cannot keep up its bargain with its own people to deliver on economic growth, then what will be the internal repercussions in China? So what if I mean, that is intentional? Is, <coughs> no, it's can't be intentional. That's too machiavellian. No, it can't be intentional. But will that China then become a more assertive, a more demanding China to the rest of the world? Will be one belt, one road, deliver everything that it has promised? Because huge promises are made. Promises made in Africa. How are those promises going to be delivered? Yeah, that's because right. they have promised to buy resources in Africa. There won't be so much of a demand for it. So there are big issues that are tied up in this entire process, to which nobody has an easy answer. Nobody has an answer. As an example, probably it's an exaggerated an example or an anecdotal thing. There was this company that we were working with in the US, large company. Recently, they decided to lay off or move 5,000 jobs away from US, California. The plan was to move half to China and half to India. And then that's where this whole thing, the last 6.0, this whole issue of China slowing down and all that stuff. And they took a decision to move 4,000 jobs to India and 1,000 jobs to China. <laughs> Whether it's a one-off thing or joke. Will that come into perspective? We don't know, but that's what happened. See, I mean, uh, put it in a very crude fashion, economics is all about belief and all about speculations. So if Chinese economy is going down for Lehman, it means that if he's investing in Chinese bonds, he's not going to get good returns, first. Second thing is that as what Ambassador Sir has said that, if he's making investment and he's depending on China as he's one of us, one of the places or even in GPN, it is going to affect its market future. So it creates its own cascading effects. And we have gone through this. I mean, August 11, the, the, the Shanghai Stock Exchange crashes. And on the second day, you know, like when the, the last state wakes up actually, you know, the China is about two and a half hours ahead of us. So they open market at about 10 o'clock here, it's 8.30, we're still taking a cup sip of coffee and things like that. When we reach office, it's already known in Shanghai. We get the news that the market is collapsing. We suddenly react to it. The market goes down. And by 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in India, when it is 3.30 in Shanghai, that market recovers. We say, okay, no, all, everything looks fine, man. I mean, why do you get scared? No, this is, this is the fact. You go to the Bombay Stock Exchange, follow the graph. 11th August, 12th August, 13th August. 13th August was Thursday. And 13th August the market closes. They have to balance the accounts. So this was this this was quite. I mean, this was obvious to happen. If you go 11, 12 in August, go go and look at the stock exchange, uh, that graph, right? We're used to graph everywhere, from hospitals to birth and everywhere. Look at that graph. 
At 10 o'clock, it is somewhere very panicking, 11 o'clock panicking, and 1 p.m., 2 p.m., it is very steady. So this is what happens, actually. This is the economy, this is the global economy, and China is an integral part of it, and not, the Chinese economy is not somewhere sitting in, somewhere in Mars or somewhere in Jupiter, it's part of it. So you are tied to that economy very closely. You cannot think, how oh, is the China, Chinese economy, something happens in Beijing, you cool down, I mean, it's okay. Have cookies and a cup of coffee, but that doesn't really happen here in the real world. We are closely interconnected, so it is, it, it is bound to happen that way. Good idea. Uh, what, uh, what is economic bad news could just be ecological good news, because the levels of consumption that we've had, if every individual were to reach European or, say, American levels, would need four Earths to survive on. So, a meltdown of the economy, I mean, it, it couldn't happen any late in coming. It's probably right that the meltdown comes so that we come up with the newer answers as to where we live our lives. And China could lead the way by just going down under and taking a body with it, and then we come up with a new <laughs> way of doing things. Thank you everyone for the engaging discussion that we just had. Uh, just moving to the next one, next program. Uh, so we'll be having a discussion.